we visit the workspace of Long Island ceramicist, Gina Mars. So welcome everyone to a very special edition to Artist Encounters, I'm Kate Schwarty and uh, my co-host Larissa Grass from the studio at Gallery North. And Hello. We are very excited to be joined today by artist Gina Mars. Gina is a ceramic artist and potter and instructor extraordinaire. Um, and we're so thrilled to be talking today to her about her work and uh, her work will be featured in the upcoming exhibition, Chroma Tenacity. So Gina, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you got started doing ceramic work? Well, it's a very interesting story. Um, I actually went to Long Island University to become a social studies teacher. And that was back in the late 80s. And um, you have to take electives when you go to college. So I signed up for a ceramics class. I figured, ah, oh, it looks like fun, it's easy, you know, I'll get an easy A in there, and then I'll be out of there. Um, so I showed up for the class, and my teacher was a little tiny woman about so big, and she had studied in the Bauhaus in Germany, and she was also um, a survivor of Nazi Germany. And she had this really heavy German accent. And um, so she was my instructor, and we became very close. Um, I spent a lot of time at the studio. I became an assistant. And one day I explained to her that, you know, it's very expensive and I'm going to have to take a little time off so I can uh, work and get money to go to college. And she said, well, no, you can't leave. Uh, we love your work. We think you have a lot of potential. So we'll make sure we take care of you financially. So you can become a social studies teacher, uh, an art teacher, and teach special needs, which is how I started out teaching special needs students. So I said, okay. And for the next couple of years, I got my undergraduate and graduate work. So I became a teacher um, in social studies, art, and special needs. And I taught at the college. Um, we had an alternative learning program there. So I taught high school students. I worked with the college students. And um, the biggest breakthrough for me was meeting my fellow college students who were mostly of um, Asian descent. So one day I went outside and I saw them raku firing their work. And I was like, what is going on? Like fire, flame, color. And it just blew my mind away. So I learned the Raku process from the other students and I started creating my own glazes and um, creating tons of work. You know, of course, when you're in college, it's very experimental. And um, I just became so enamored with the technique that after I graduated, I continued to create Raku work and built a Raku kiln in my yard a traveling Raku kiln so I could take it anywhere I wanted and Raku fire. And it just took off from there. You know, I, I taught social studies, I taught art uh, at the high school level, but ultimately I focused on running my own business and creating my own artwork. And that is where it all started. One elective in college and my life changed completely and you know today um, I teach at the Spirit of Huntington Art Center where I'm able to teach Raku and all forms of ceramic arts with any age any ability which is really how things work at my school any person and any ability um, is what goes on, whether you're five years old or you're 85 years old and you wanna learn Raku, the potter's wheel, sculpting, maybe you just wanna get away from it all and you know play with some clay. Um, that is what we do and that's pretty much my entire life is ceramics. That's amazing. Yeah. The piece that you're holding right here, can you tell us a little bit about it? 
Well, this is a Raku piece. It's a little mask uh, that I made. It hangs on the wall. And it's a copper glaze, um, which is pretty much what I'm known for. I like to spray um, copper oxide on the pieces and then fire them to 2000 degrees. And when they hit 2000 degrees, I take them out of the kiln. It's a rather violent process. You know, you're, you're covered up and you've got these gloves on and you're dirty and you've got these long tongs. You take the fiery piece out of the kiln and then you put it into a pit in the ground and you put combustibles like straw or newspaper on it and it ignites. And then you cover it with a garbage can and what happens in the pit is pretty amazing because the piece is saying, I need oxygen. Where is it? I need oxygen. You've just covered me with a can. There's just smoke. What is gonna happen? So all of that smoke turns the piece black and the lack of oxygen works with the glaze to bring out all of the interesting colors and iridescence. In addition to creating the colors, we have some special glazes like the white crackle where the carbon gets stuck in the cracks because the glaze cracks as it hits the atmosphere when you take the garbage can off and then all of the carbon fills in the cracks making for this incredible look. So these are some of the glazes and techniques that I utilize. And I can honestly tell you in over 30 years, I've never had the same results on any piece twice. So every day that I go out there and work, I get something different or my students get something different. And that's what makes it exciting. You do these very complex um, pieces with lids on top of vessels, and how do you plan those out, knowing that there is a lot of um, kind of spontaneity to how the glazes transform in the uh, process? Do you do any sketches ahead of time, or is it very kind of um, like a natural process that evolves? Well, um, it usually comes to me about 2 a.m in the morning when I get a little vision of what I want to do. And then I sketch it out and I create what it is that I was thinking about. And a lot of my pieces, um, I call them ritual vessels, but to me, they are very ancient looking and they remind me of my childhood, which was watching old movies like you know, um, Sabu, the thief of Baghdad. You know, there was a genie and there was a beautiful genie, um, you know, bottle that they rubbed the genie to come out of. And these things stuck in my mind, vessels that held something important. Um, so I always like to think about that when I'm creating. I always like to make a vessel, but yet something on the lid that is of importance to me, something interesting. Like with the ritual vessels and the portals, to me, they're traveling through time and you can look through them and see the past or the future. So they have meaning to me, which is very important. Um, they tell stories and that's why I create the lids the way that I do. The idea of a vessel that can transport through time or in my mind, what can it do? Yeah. And it's so beautiful to look at. Yeah. It, and you feel that in the pieces. I mean, they're so, they have such a, like a magical quality to them of something that's totally unique. Every time we have one of your pieces in the shop, I'm always thinking like it, it needs to be under a spotlight on a pedestal in a room where it is just the center of attention because it is just so unique and it just holds so much meaning to it that you could constantly get out of it of looking at it. It always feels like it's something that I've seen in a museum. Like you get that timeless quality that it sounds like you're aiming for. Wow. Something ancient. 
Well, I'm glad, you know, you're seeing that because that's what I, I meant. And I don't always know what people think of the pieces. And sometimes artists have an insecurity too. I mean, I create and I create and I'm compelled to create, but I'm like, what do other people really think of what I'm creating? And there are so many elements to what I'm creating. It's not just a pop, but it's the glaze and the lid and how they were joined together so they don't break and fall apart. And there are other elements, like some of the pieces now have African porcupine quills, which, by the way, never stick yourself with an African porcupine quill. It hurts really, really bad. Um, I had them shipped in to incorporate it into my work and like stab myself. Oh, with no. One. Yes. Um, you, you, know, you incorporate a lot of unique materials, in, especially in the pieces that we're gonna, going to be seeing in this exhibition too, right? You have some mm -hmm. that have, um, what is it, the, um, Bristle, like a bristling oh. texture. What, what type of material is that on, on some of the lidded vases? Uh, some of them are dyed animal fibers, so from different animals, um, and I've threaded them through the, the uh, tops because they give it more of a ritualistic look, um, I feel. And I also was very influenced by one of my students years ago, Estelle Heinrich, who now lives in South Dakota um, with her family. She was a teacher on Long Island and she's 96 years old now. And she was a student of mine since about, I was about 25 till I was about 50. So we had this incredible bond and everything she worked with was like an animal fur or feather or bones or, something from the earth and after all those years she just kind of influenced some of the work that i do and we still communicate she um, is has to live in a home now because she's elderly but we communicate and the interesting thing is she has developed dementia however whenever we talk she never forgets me or the raku process wow. so you know it's just very touching to me that we have this bond and it's never left after all these years. So that is like critically important to me to have that. And I try to show in my work also some of her ideas, which she was so influential. Would, would you say you learn as much from your students as they learn from you? Uh, or I more? learn more from my students. Mm -hmm. My students are worldly and a lot of them are older than me and just incredibly creative, intuitive, and amazing human beings. So every day that I work with them, you know, they look up to me, but they don't realize. I'm like, thank goodness I know you because whatever they say, <laughs> I listen and they know what they're talking about. So on many levels, artistic levels and personal levels and worldly levels, I mean, it's a wonderful relationship to have because um, every single person has something to offer. Mm -hmm. You know, you may get a student every once in a while who'll come in and they're so negative and, you know, quiet and they just want to do their thing. But after you get to know them, you realize that every person has an incredible story mm -hmm. and their story is coming out in their art. And then if you're lucky enough, they'll share it with you. You know, why do I want to create art? And what, what introduced me to art? What are my goals? And I find that so interesting and I, I think about it. You know, here's a new student, you know, this is what they want to do. How can I help them to reach their goal now that I understand what they're about? And then we start this journey and luckily the journey has been going on 30 years with some of my students. Yeah. We're lifers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we just started children's classes again. And teaching children is just incredible in itself because their view of the world and what they're creating and why they're creating it too is on a totally different level. 
and you know when they make something they learn the potter's wheel and they're actually make something it's like wow wait till my parents see this oh my gosh <laughs> they're gonna eat cereal out of this for the rest of their life <laughs> you know? and it's just so it's so great so i have like this little following of of young kids and recently i did an interview um uh with News 12, Waldo Cabrera, and um, it was about my relationship with a student that I had much younger than me. And I didn't even realize how her life was influenced and how our work was influencing each other. And we did this whole talk about it. And I was like, wow, I didn't realize this was going on. But, you know, we work together and it's like a little symphony and i feel like someday this particular student is going to be working for me or teaching ceramics because it has had such an impact on her life how so. do you feel that that informs your own work when you're working with the students like do you feel like that you take something back from those experiences to your own your own practice at times or well um technically i i know a lot but visually and ideas, um, I feel it's a huge way for me to experiment and become inspired. Um, over here, we have a piece that was created last week by one of my students, and she created this form with the horses. So I looked at that and I said, you know, that is so inspiring. I think I wanna do a horse sculpture. And that's actually what I'm doing. I'm making a wall relief with galloping horses and I'm gonna cut it into like 12 by 12 sections so I can fire it in the kiln. And then it's gonna be a giant wall piece. I feel like my students are incredibly inspiring to me. Just cause I'm a teacher doesn't mean I know everything or you know, all my ideas are the best. So we feed off of each other. Like there's like something so exciting about making something you can use. Like you were talking about, they were excited that maybe their parents would use their cereal bowl for the rest of their life. Yes. What is the first use, like utilitarian thing that you made as a ceramicist? Like what's the first thing you made? Well, the first thing that I ever made, and I still have it, is a box form. <gasps> okay. So I made a very small box form in elementary school and my mom recently gave it to me. And then after she gave me the box, she showed me a coil pot leaf vessel that she made. And she explained to me how that's where I got, you know, my talent from. <laughs> and I asked her for the leaf. I'm like, you know, I'd love to put it in my collection. And she was like, no, I'm really not ready to part with that yet. You know, it's very, very special. So I said, okay, someday when you're ready, I would love to have your leaf vessel. Um, but yes, yes, my mom was into ceramics and which is actually kind of funny because when I was between seven and 10, we used to go to these ceramic stores back in the eighties. Mm -hmm. So my mom and I would show up, you know, Wednesday night and the piece would already be made. It would be slip cast, yeah. you know, and we'd clean it up and we'd paint it, glaze it and everything. And it was like mom's night out, you know, with your daughter. And those were the most incredible times I ever had. I, I remember the place. I could still smell mm -hmm. the smell of the clay in there. So it's kind of what I'm doing now, but now we do everything from scratch. Mm -hmm. You know, there are no molds. Everybody learns how to create their cups and bowls by hand. And um, so I'm kind of, I guess, bringing that into the future, what I did, you know, back then with my mom. Thank you. Yeah. So. Feels like in a way it's storing memories, <laughs> storing memories in these vessels and things mm -hmm. like that too, right? Like there's this history that's in tuned in the pieces themselves beyond just, I mean, the fact that they have the, uh, like a historical nature to them in and of themselves. That's exactly what, I, what I'm trying to get out there. That's exactly what I'm thinking. Yeah. You know, these ritualistic vessels, they're gonna be around for a long time. Um, they look like they came out of the earth. Um, and I want them to be here 
creating memories for a really long time. So everything on these shelves is student work? It's all student work mm. created in the last two weeks. Everything. This armadillo? Yes. <laughs> students as young as five which I actually complained about I was like how come there's a five-year-old in my <laughs> class 10 to 14 mm. so she shows up and the five-year-old is really going on 30 <laughs> and could run the entire program without me so it was just incredible to experience you know that and how she just fit in so she stayed and she's part of our group so it's really just, you know, about everyone. It's kind of ageless or, you know, it's like, why are you here? Did, did, are you just creating or do you have a need or have you had a loss in your life? And we come together and it's very nurturing to be in that environment. Um, so I think it's a good thing. And I just don't think that we could live without it because it's like part of us so much. You know, people say, don't you ever get sick of clay? And I'm like, no, never. I always, the wheels are spinning. Like after I see you today, I'm going home and I'm working on this incredible new project. So. So Gina, are you an educator first or a ceramicist first? Wow, really tough question. You know, it's a balance. So I feel like there are some days I feel like I'm an educator first because that is my focus three days a week. And then the other days, it's just me quietly creating. So I really can't answer that because I feel like I'm both. It's really like a give and take kind of thing for between the two experiences. It is. And I feel like I need it to be both. Yeah. Because if you're just your creative artist and you're in your studio alone, after a while, you know, you become like this starved for attention individual. You need to be working with people and teaching and showing them what art is all about. So I feel like I need that. 